Okay, here we are. Hi, Robin. Hi, Sam. How are I'm you? I'm well, thanks. I'm very well. It's good to see you online. We're normally having a coffee at Darling Street, but it's nice to see you online all the same. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. at night. At night, exactly. <laughs> and, and we're doing it at night. Have we got a few... We're doing it at night so all our clients who are overseas can um, uh, can partake. So it's eight o'clock in the evening here in Australia. So for all our clients who are um, in their probably middle of your day, uh, hopefully you've tuned in. I can see there's quite a few people who have tuned in. Um, so thank you for those who are online. Um, for those of you who are online, can you give us a bit of a shout out? In the, in the right hand side is a chat box and you can write in the chat box. Um, where you are. So I like to get a feel for where people are. So let me know the town or the city or the country uh, where you are overseas. Um, or even if you're here in Australia, it'd be good to hear from people. Um, South Africa, Brisbane, Western Cape, Joburg, Cape Town. That's great. Thank you, people. Um, the chat box is there throughout the session. Please use it. Um, you, Rob and I are happy to field questions throughout um, the session tonight. So uh, the more interaction, the better as far as we are concerned. Um, without further ado, okay. Um, Sable International, who are we? And Sam Hopwood and Robin Vogels, who are we? So a quick introduction about uh, the our relevant uh, businesses and, and who we are. Um, my name is Sam Hopwood. I'm a registered migration agent. I'm the managing director of Sable International Australia. Um, I've worked for the business for 18 years. Um, Sable International is a group of different um, businesses who provide services to people who are looking to relocate overseas. Uh, we manage the immigration process, uh, we have a lot of ancillary services in other businesses also, like wealth and tax and foreign exchange. Um, we do property. There's all sorts of stuff that we do. Um, but like I say, I'm an Australian registered migration agent, so I focus on helping people to migrate to Australia. Um, I deal with immigration law day in, day out. But today is not about immigration law. It's about something much more exciting than that. It's about actually coming to Australia. Um, and that's why I've got Robin here, because Robin is the expert on moving to different countries. Um, I've known Robin for many years. Um, we run totally separate businesses. We're not related in our business entities whatsoever, but we do share clients quite often. Um, and the reason I've got Robin on tonight is because Robin wrote a blog recently um, and it, it's called 15 Things I've Learned in the 15 Years Living in Australia. Um, and I'm just gonna put the link in the chat box now. So you can all go and read it after the, um, after the session is over. It's a great read. It resonated with me on so many different levels. Um, as an Australian and as someone who works in the industry, um, there's so much in that blog which is so valuable and, and it's written really well. So go and read it. Um, that's my advice. So I'm gonna let Robin introduce herself now and tell you a little bit about um, who she is and where she's been uh, and why she's here tonight and potentially what she can do for you. Over to you, Robin. Thanks, Sam. Um, that was quite the introduction. I appreciate um, you reaching out and, and reading the blog, first of all. Um, and it's nice to hear that it resonated with you as an Australian. And I think that's because you understand you've, you've been in this industry for as many or more years than I probably have been and understand what it's like for people who are trying to move and perhaps underestimate what it is like to to live in Australia. I think we all have that ideal vision or that stereotypical vision of it's Australia, it will be easy and then get here and it's not so easy. Um, so for everybody who's watching, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Robin Vogels. I'm the owner of Personnel Relocations. I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. We help everybody once the visa is approved or even before. So we're the step after the, the good work that Sable International does. So our job is to help you find a house, find a school that's right for your children, find a suburb and settle you in, get your tax file number, your bank accounts, all these little moving parts is, is what our company does. We do that under the personal relocations brand, which has been going since 2008. I started the business when I arrived here from France. So I've personally, from those of you who haven't placed my accent already and considering how many South Africans are on board, I'm born and bred in Durban 
um, left South Africa in the 90s. I've had 10 years in England where both my children were born, then went to Singapore, then on to France, and finally on to Australia. So I've been here for 15 years, which is where I... <laughs> sure. You've, you've migrated across the world, Roman. You've, you've done it. You've lived it. You've breathed it. Um, no, wonder you, yes. no wonder you work in the industry now. Yes, and I think that's what sets me apart is that I have lived and breathed it and I've had children and brought them through the, the system of moving around the world. So, um, yeah, that, when I started the business, that was one of the reasons is that the relocation companies that were here potentially did not have the experience of actually moving. So I've done nine cities in 15 years, um, lived and worked in, in nine cities around the world. So. Coming to Australia, I've probably moved well over a thousand families. Wow, a thousand. So when it comes to getting advice, <laughs> easily. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I had to count all the children, <laughs> yeah. it would probably add up to a lot more. But um, yeah, a, over a thousand families is what I've done in the 15 years. Amazing. So there's probably very few scenarios that I might not have seen or experienced for myself. No, for sure, for sure. Let me tell you, um, when a client asks me about Sam, how do I ship my uh, expensive car to Australia or Sam, what schools should I put my children in, in the suburbs in North Melbourne? Um, or um, will schooling cost me X amount in South Australia as compared to Queensland? Um, or, how, or should I ship my TV to Australia? All these questions I get, I'd say, I don't know. Um, I'm an immigration law specialist. I'm not a relocation specialist. You need to speak to a relocation specialist. And that's, and that's why I send my clients to you because I know you take so good care of them and you have all the answers to all the questions um, that I don't have the answers to and personally don't have the time to deal with either. So thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you for supporting my clients uh, throughout the years. Um, we better get on with, um, with tonight's session. Um, these are the things we're going to talk about today. We're going to touch on the blog. Um, Robin wrote the book. It, Robin wrote the book literally on moving to Australia. You can go and buy it. It's on Amazon. Um, I've got my own copy here. I should have it out. Um, it's like this thick and it covers every topic you could ever think of. It's, it's fantastic. We're going to talk about, um, there's the book. There you go. I've got one of those. Um, I, think you've, I think you need to sign mine, Robin. I don't think you've signed it. Um, <laughs> we, know we need to frame it. Um, we're going to talk about this is a big country. How do we choose a city? How do we choose a suburb? Where do we start with that question? It's a big country and it's a big question. We're going to talk, the, we're going to talk about housing in Australia and what is currently referred to as the rental crisis in Australia. Um, we're going to talk about DIY research and how you do your own research and, and how you go about asking certain questions on social media. And we're going to do some Q&A at the end. We can do Q&A throughout. Please um, send us questions in the chat box if, uh, if you've got any. Um, so Robin's blog, uh, like I said, I loved Robin's blog and it resonated with me on so many different levels. Um, and I'm just scrolling through it on the right hand side of my other screen at the moment. Medical. Medical is an obvious one and people say they're coming to Australia because of the medical system. I never, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the medical system in Australia, but um, about 18 months ago, I had a child, my first child, and <laughs> in the public health system at the um, women's hospital here in Australia, I don't know that there is better service that you could get anywhere in the world. And I've had friends who have used the uh, private system as well. Um, and the two stand, from what I can see, fairly close side by side, Robin. Uh, and that's been my experience as well. I mean, having lived in England and both my children born in England, yep. I've gone through through that system. And we're talking about, you know, early 2000s that um, I was in England when the NHS in the UK was world class. Um, and I know there's a few issues with the NHS now and nurses on strike and all sorts of things. So. I've found in Australia that there's very little difference between the private and the and Medicare, which is the NHS yeah, equivalent. Yeah. Medicare is our Australian bulk billing. There's very little difference. I think you just have to wait a little that's, bit longer. But once you're in the yeah, system, yeah. you are totally looked after. Yeah. Every nook and cranny is checked. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> you are hot, looked after. It's a high level of care, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's probably the marked difference is yeah. that if you're doing elective surgery and you're in the public health system, you're going to have to wait. Whereas the private mm -hmm. health system, but once yes. you're in either systems, they are they, yes. they are very similar. Yes, I think what people don't 
often realize is that in Australia, which I have found unique to the other countries I've lived in, is that your GP is in control of everything here. Yeah. So you can't just go and see any specialist. You know, a lot of South Africans, for example, they can say, I'm going to the specialist here. You have to go to the doctor first, get a referral. Yeah. So things like that, this, you know, it can be a little bit more of a long winded um, it's a process. We love processes always. here in Australia, yep. don't we? We love bureaucracy. We love well. processes. Um, you've got to have a license for everything. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. there's speed limits everywhere, and Even we do enforce them. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, for sure. And and mobile phones. That's a big one at the moment. Don't talk on your mobile phone. I was just phone. in Brisbane, and don't text on your yeah, mobile don't phone. Don't touch it. Don't, don't even. Don't even look at it. Don't even. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even have it on your lap no. or anything. $1,000 is the fine Ouch. for mobile phones in Brisbane. $1,000. Yeah. So Robin talks about yes. all sorts of topics in this in this uh, 15 Things I've Learned. She talks about making friends in Australia and the, the friends bit made me laugh because it is it is so true. And there's an episode in, in Seinfeld that uh, that I recalled to Robin when I read the blog that is similar to this. And, and Seinfeld says something along the lines of, sorry, but we're just not looking at the moment. And, and that's kind of like here in Australia, a lot of people form their friendship group at school or at university and then they've kind of got their friends and they kind of don't need to make friends and migrants often say that oh I can't make friends with Aussies because they don't want to be friends with me what's your experience Robin well very true people come out and they I think there's a few things to it first of all people come here and don't realize how multinational Australia is yep. it's not just Australians that here in fact on the news tonight they were saying that 30 percent of our population is now migrants yep. So that's, and it's the, the largest in the world. So that's one thing. The other thing is that, yes, as you say, they've made their friends already. And it would be the same as if somebody from Australia was going to South Africa. They wouldn't necessarily, there's sort of a, a superficial, hey, how are you going? I'll help you if you need it. But, you know, I don't really need to be your close buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there is this mateship thing going on, but we're not that close. You know, I've got my friends. Um, and yeah, I'm just not looking at the moment. But I think migrants need to really be aware of that and yes. find their own tribe. And I have so many people that I move and they say to me, I don't want to mix with other British, French, South Africans. I want to mix with, with Australians or, or more locals. Yep. Um, and that's all very well, but then you need to find something in common with that person. It's not about the culture. It's not about the religion or any, well, could be about the religion, but you have to have something in common with that person. Yep. And don't get into a migrant silo, for example, of just staying within your own culture. Yeah. Do diversify, but, you know, if it's an art or a craft or a sport or something else, you, you could have a very wide range of friends here, but don't expect that every Australian neighbour is going to be your new best buddy. No, we're a little bit standoffish. Um, um, Just the British ones. Maybe it's the British. Maybe it's the British ones. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> Like I said, go and read the blog. It's a great read and um, we could spend all night talking about the blog, but we need to move on. So um, we're going to move on and talk about your book, your DIY Move to Australia book, and it's available to buy mm. on Amazon. How many pages is it, Robin? How many words is it? Uh, 306. 306 pages. 306. In the ebook, there's over 200 links that you can link through to get further information. Well, it's in the paperback as well. It's just easier if you're online. For a while um, there, 16 chapters. For a while there, I was using it as a dictionary um, for when someone would ask me a question. Someone would ask me a question, I go, oh, "Hang on, I'll just go to the book and I'll get the book out and like rifle through the book and find, Brilliant. find the section on customs and if I want to import a antique." clock what do i do you know or you've answered a lot of questions in that book um so yes. if people have got if you're the type of person who wants to do a lot of research and type of person who wants a high level of detail buy the book that's my best advice mm. Well, honestly, I mean, the, the whole reason behind writing the book was because there are so many people that are falling through the cracks, especially those that are perhaps coming on a skilled a skilled migrant visa where it's state sponsored and they don't have work yet. They don't have that corporate cotton wool wrapped around them. And this is when you do this and this is when you do that. And we're going to hold your hand through this. Yep. There are so many people falling through the cracks and not preparing both physically for the move. They don't know who to trust. They're asking on social media. They're getting the wrong advice. Yep. Um, 
you know, furniture removals is a prime example of people saying, you know, how much is it going to cost for a 40 foot container? Yeah. Well, you can't compare to two people. It's just everything is different. Everything is different. You can't compare it. So the book is really there as a guide. Um, and the amount of people I've had on Zoom who hold up their little book and it's got all the little yeah. tags little sticking out of it. <laughs> and hollow pieces, it's all dog eared on the edges. Yeah. We've read it for. Yeah. 4 million times that that's yeah. great it's a good point you raised just then about the difference between the corporates and the individual families who come over because here it's able we obviously do both and, and we do a lot of corporates yes. a lot of visas for businesses bringing people in from overseas and then we do a lot of individual applicants as well and it's it can be a very different um experience for those two different um sets of people because often the corporates have um, on arrival services that might be provided through the business where someone will pick them up from the airport and they already will have a rental provided for them or a short-term accommodation and mm -hmm. they'll be able to advise their um, employee on where you put your child into school and all those sorts of things but for the person who doesn't come in supported by a corporate entity like it's a it's a daunting task right it's a minefield yeah it's an absolute minefield. So, you know, and, and I want people to make the right start in Australia because I honestly believe if you make the right start, everything will take the right direction. You're not going to be saying, oh, nobody here likes me, nobody this, nobody that. Yeah. You know, I'm not, this isn't for me kind of thing. If you make the right start, you understand what you're doing and you can take control of your relocation. But most of all, you can save money. I mean, I think the book is $25. It would literally save you thousands, thousands. if you just understood how to choose. Oh, just on the furniture removals and the temporary accommodation, it would honestly, <laughs> it would save thousands. I don't, if, I don't um, know if this is in the book, but I'm going to tell a little story that you told me that I think is just funny and just epitomizes you don't know what you don't know right so you told me a story years and years ago about a client of yours who um put their bins out on the street and the bin man came along and the bin man didn't pick up their bins and he picked up all the other bins yep. up and down the street and then he left their bins full of garbage and this poor person yes. was at a loss why are they not picking up my bins what have i done wrong don't they like me? They know I'm from such and such a country or whatever the case might be. Now, it came out to something so, so simple. And that is you have to place your bin on the street facing forward. So the bin machine can come, yeah. pick it up and throw it in the bin with the automatic arm. If you place it upside or back to front, then the bin man won't, he can't, the machine doesn't work like that. So yeah, the lid won't open, the lid won't, open. won't empty That's and right. you're going to annoy the garbage exactly the garbage, the garbage all over the street so he didn't pick up the bins who tells you that no one tells you which way to face your bins out in the street like you just know that because yeah. you're an australian and you grew up in australia but your client didn't know that and and little things like that that you have to go through yeah. life and discover when you get to a new country yes. it's it's all the little things that add up right that makes the whole thing feel yeah. daunting it's i i i could probably write a book on all the funny questions if i put it that way that i've been asked that might seem funny from my perspective yep. but there's no such thing as a stupid question Absolutely. in a relocation but you know somebody who's come from a country where they don't receive um mail or snail mail yeah. as not emails um they, they, they forget to go and check their post yeah. box and i had one lady who phoned me once and said to me when am i going to get a, an invoice from the electricity company i haven't had an invoice i haven't had a and I said to him, well, you should have had a welcome pack by now. You've been in there a month. You're like, no, nope, haven't had anything. So I said, have you checked your mail? She said, well, I've even checked my junk. And I was like, no, 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 your actual mail, your postbox, you need to go and check it. <laughs> it's the little things, isn't it? And that's why you got to buy the book yeah. and read the book and, you know, ask Robin all the questions that you need to ask because it will literally save you a lot of money, but it will save you a lot of mental health stress right heartache heartache <laughs> because it, it is you know some you know we talk a lot about culture shock and people think they're immune from culture shock but when you're down in the dumps that you're over that honeymoon stage of arriving all the kids are at school you've got all these boxes around you it can be quite depressing and then the garbage guy doesn't empty your bin it's just the last <laughs> straw <laughs> this country hates me i'm, I'm going home even yeah. the bin man hates yeah. me yeah yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, I can see. I can see how that would work. Um, all right, we must move along. 
Um, how do I choose a city? How do I choose a suburb? This is a big country. Yeah. Look, from an okay, I'll, yes. I'll have a little bit of input here. Obviously, from an immigration point of view, if you're coming uh, to be employed by a business, or if you're coming under a state sponsorship uh, or a regional sponsorship, then you know your sort of focus has been narrowed somewhat um, because your visa might determine whereabouts you need to live for a certain period of time. Um, but for a lot of other people, you've got the freedom to choose anywhere in Australia. Um, and it's a big country. I guess some people have relatives that live here and maybe they want to be close to those relatives and that's a, that's a focal point. But for a lot of people, it's kind of like pin the tail on the donkey and like stick a pin in a map and say, well, should we try that place? Or everyone just goes to the big cities. Is that right? Well, <laughs> it's one of those great questions and probably one of those that you'll pass over to me when somebody says, well, where am I going to live? You know, you'll, you'll say, fine, Robin. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, the determining factor comes down to probably two main things. One is climate yep. um, and the other is budget. Yep. So cost of living for the different areas, uh, sorry, work, work opportunities. If you were going to be in mining, you probably wouldn't come and live in Melbourne. Yep. You know, you'd go to Perth yep. <laughs> or you'd go somewhere else. So um, starting with climate, I mean, some people don't want the humidity. So then Brisbane, Cairns, that, those areas wouldn't really appeal to All them. my clients from Durban want like... to go straight to the Gold Coast because they say that the yeah, climate's the same. I can relate. Yep. You were there yesterday, <laughs> weren't you? I was there yesterday. Yes, I love it there. I love it there. But I did find, I find it a bit quiet for me. Yep. And I'm not a city person, but I, I like that Melbourne is eccentric. It's um, very arty. There's, you know, there's just, it's more multicultural. So if we, it's, if we yeah, talk, just got a few if we talk broadly about the big three, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Mm -hmm. I was born in Sydney. It's a beautiful city. I think it's quite pretentious myself. Yes. Um, I think it's harder to make friends in Sydney than it is in, in, in Melbourne, personally. The the harbour is beautiful. I think the traffic is shocking yes. to get around from one side of the city to the other. I think it's difficult. Um, but I'm born and bred there. I've got family there. I've spent a lot of time there. Um, I've lived in Melbourne for uh, 13 years now. And I still think it's a it's a great cosmopolitan city. It's got a European feel yes. to it. Um, it's got a sporting vibe, which is fantastic. Um, it's easier to get around, in my opinion. It's easier to commute through. Uh, it's easier to drive through. It's not as pretty, perhaps, as Sydney. Everyone goes to Sydney. They fly into Sydney. Oh. They see the harbour and they just go, oh, wow. Everyone wants to live in Sydney. Well, it's iconic. It is. It's iconic. Yeah. It's, it's that dream. That's It's that Australian dream when you see the Opera House or the bridge. Um, I actually wrote a blog, it's probably only just gone up now, which was the differences that I've seen between Melbourne and Sydney. Um, and that's quite an interesting read for those people who might be debating the two cities um, and exactly the things you were saying now. I do think Sydney's got better public transport than Melbourne has, mostly because they've got a train to the airport yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah. that Melbourne still doesn't have. Um, there but there is that, you know, you take a you take a wrong turn in Sydney and you're following a, a cliff face. Oh, and a, one way. Or something and you, can't, and you, can't, you can't do a U-turn and all of a sudden you're at Mascot Airport and you want to be on the other side of the bridge and, yeah. and you're crying to yourself. Yeah. I've just put a link in the chat box yeah. to your Sydney versus Australia um, blog. So yeah, thank go you. and check that one out. Uh, and I think the cost of living in Sydney is actually creeping up a little bit quicker than Melbourne. Yeah. So when I talk about you choosing a city based on price, and again, which visa gets free schooling? Well, Victoria wins hands down then because okay. we get free schooling on a, on a temporary visa, whereas New South Wales doesn't. Yep. So those are all the things that you need to take into consideration. But again, you have to know those things. Like you said, you only know what you know. So you have to know those things to ask those questions sometimes. And that's a good point that you just raised, and that is that Victoria, we, oh, um, yeah, Victoria wins as far as schooling is concerned for people who are on a temporary visa. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people might be coming to Australia on permanent visas and they might think, oh, well, all the states and territories are the same if I'm coming on a permanent visa, but that's not true. And it, it's a good point that people don't particularly understand, and that is that we have seven different states and territories and we have three levels of government. We have local government, we have state government, we have federal government, right? And the state, yes. the state governments control certain things like schooling, right? So state governments control the price of schooling. So the price of schooling in Australia for a permanent resident or an Australian citizen is different by every single state. Am I right? Yes, yeah. correct. 
Correct. And it's interesting, I, I'm about to write a blog comparing Brisbane. Um, and Brisbane, you would generally the cost of living is seen as being cheaper, but not if you have a child under the age of 12. Really? Because one, you don't get the free schooling, you don't get some of the kindergarten rebates, but also there's very little support for um, sports for under 11 year olds. So the parents are paying a lot more for their children to participate in sports. Yep. In Melbourne and Sydney, during school holidays, things like zoos, exhibitions, art museums, all those things are free yep. for children. Yep. In Brisbane, they're not. Yep. So for the parent to take her son to go and see, you know, a dinosaur exhibition is setting her back $50 just for the two of them. Uh -huh. So there's those little things to take into consideration. No one else is going to know that information except for you. Um... <laughs> I, yeah, look, choosing, choosing where to live, it's a difficult one. I guess people will have their own preferences, as you say, built on lifestyle mm. and on climate and that sort of stuff. But then even if you know which city you want to live in, well, then you've got to choose which suburb you're going to live in. Yes, yes. So, so taking that down even further, people really need to consider what they do each day. And some people are coming without jobs, so they don't even have that as a pinpoint to sort of use and and decide where they're going to live from there. But you have to find out what are you going to be doing every day? If you perhaps going to church and you might be, be volunteering in a church and having to be there three times a week, that's going to affect your commute times. How are you getting there? All those things need to be taken in consideration when you start narrowing down a, a suburb. Um, and there's websites and things that can help you. But again, you need to know what to ask. So it's perhaps better to speak to somebody, even booking a one hour consultation with a relocation person can help you just take a holistic view of everything that you need to take into consideration. What schooling are you looking for? What commute times are you looking at? What types of, you know, how are you going to get to work? How are you going to get to school? Do you want to walk? To, do you want the kids to walk to school? I have a lot of clients who just want that idea that children can exercise without feeling like it's exercise let's walk down to the shops let's walk down to the school mm. um you know you probably don't want to be staying in a hilly area if that's the case yeah. so it's all those little things that can make up what your suburb choices might look like yeah and budget yeah. budget again has to come into it the closer to the city you are the more expensive it gets yep. So people will say to me, can I find a house for them at, you know, $600 a week? Yes, I can, but you might need to compromise on 45 minutes to the city. Yeah, yeah. So it's working out what those compromises might look like for you. But I always say you have to find an anchor of what you're going to be doing. And people will say to me, oh, I want to be close to the beach. And well, how often are you going to go to the beach? Yeah. Well, probably once or twice a month, maybe every Friday. Well, you can drive that for 10 minutes. Yep. You don't have to live at the beach. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> you're going to go to work every day or, or five days a week. And you're going to drop yes. the kids at school five days a week. And as you say, those anchor points are yes. so much more important. All right. This brings us to housing in Australia and, mm -hmm. and a, a, a term that you and I are very familiar with, and that is the rental crisis of Australia. Du, 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 du. Um, <laughs> it's on the TV every night or just about. There's something in the paper about it just about every day. Um, we simply put, we don't have enough um, houses in Australia to house all the people mm -hmm. who want to be here. Is that right? That's that's it. And and to be honest, there's always been a rental shortage. It's definitely at a crisis situation now. And a lot of people say to me, um, you know, is it real? You know, are they just is it media hype? I can assure you it's very real. Yeah. You know, when we're going to rental inspections and there's 20 or 30, sometimes even 50 people there, I would say that it's it's easing in certain parts of the market. Um, and, and again, it comes perhaps to some of those compromises where in Adelaide, for example, there's a rental crisis, but the, the issue with Adelaide is the public transport doesn't go very far from the city. So it's not like in Melbourne where we can say, well, let's try a suburb 10 minutes away because there's more housing availability. In Adelaide, then there's no public transport. So it still keeps the, the, the search area quite small. Um, Certainly in, in the low budget category, there's a lot more inter international students in that category. So you've got a lot more competition, yep. but people then say to me, okay, well, you know, if, you know, if I've got somebody in the middle of the road and they say, okay, well, let me put another $500 into it and go like really way out. 
that's all very well. Yes, sure, there's not much competition, but then there's fewer houses. So once you get to a certain price bracket, then there's just not that many houses. There's no investors out there at the moment. Yep. Mortgage rates are going up, so people just aren't buying investment properties. A lot of the Airbnbs that we had come out of COVID and onto the rental market have now gone back into Airbnb. Yep. So there's all those contributing factors as well as the growing population in Australia. Yep. I'm going to... Um, ask you a question, but I'm just going to deal with a question that is in, in the chat box. Someone's asked me in the chat box sure. if this webinar is going to cover aged parent visas, subclass 804 with a, uh, with a bridging visa. If not, do we provide consultations regarding that particular visa? Um, so to the person who asked that question, I'm just putting a link in the chat box that will take you to um, a webinar I did a couple of weeks or a couple of months ago on parent visas that I did with my colleague Tana and Tana sits in our uh, Cape Town office. Um, so have a check that person, check that um, webinar out on YouTube if you're interested on parent visas and then um, contact us to have a free consultation. We're more than happy to help you with your parent visas and any other visas that people are interested in. But today we're not gonna talk visas. We're not gonna talk immigration law today. We're gonna talk about relocating to Australia. And my next question is, so Robin, what services do you provide to help someone find a rental before they arrive or after they arrive or when do you start that search for someone? Mm. Um, I would say probably 95% of our clients are asking us to find a rental before they arrive. Um, and why not? Why spend $10,000 on an Airbnb and drive around the suburbs lost yep. Yep. <laughs> for the first few weeks? People underestimate jet lag and how they're going to feel in the first few weeks. And then they've only booked two weeks accommodation because they're trying to keep the price down. Um, so finding a rental before people arrive is definitely our most popular service at the moment. Um, and people are just really scared about what documentation they need to do. Our rental process is hard and fast. Yeah. It it's literally changes from day to day. So helping them navigate through that, but also doing all those negotiations while they sleep. Mm. The amount of times I can send a lovely text message to say, you got the house, uh, you know, and they wake up and then they've got a house. That's all very exciting. So everything from consultations, some people just want a one hour consultation, you know, to maybe do their furniture removals or talk about their pets or suburbs. Uh, right through to full hand holding and full project management where we will move the pets, move the, do the furniture, do everything. So it's as little as much or as much as what people want. Um, and yeah, just passionate about trying to help people make the right start yep. and get the right information. Yep. So you'll custom your service based on what the client needs. If, if they need a one hour consultation yes. or if they need a suburb overview or if they need airport pickups, find me my new tenancy no, ship my pets and all the rest of it. You'll you'll do everything. That's great. Um, yeah. And logistically, I'm interested to know. So, and I know how hard it is to get a rental here in Melbourne because I've, you know, had friends arrive who, you know, have cried their eyes out because they turned up to a, mm. a, an open house or an open flat to check it out, and there were 30 other people there, and they were all clambering over each other to try and fill out an application form and, and obtain. Yep. So do you have relationships with the real estate agents, or do you have to turn up to those open days and clamber across everyone else and fill out application forms? Like Logistically, how do you do it? Um, we do have relationships with estate agents, but in such a tight rental market, I'm, I'm honest in saying that we're not getting off market opportunities because they're just not there. Yep. So it is a case of us doing the inspection. In, in um, For example, in Victoria, actually in most states, it's illegal for an estate agent to process an application unless somebody has inspected the house. So we do inspect the house on behalf of um, the, the migrant or the person that's arriving, yep. and that could be an interstate move as well. So we'll go and inspect it. We help them prepare the application, and we actually do the application with them before we inspect the property, right. obviously not processing it, processing it through to the agent, but make sure that they've got all their all the right information yep. and that they've completed the application properly because it's highly automated. And if they don't complete the application properly, they're just not even going to get shortlisted. Sure. We have 98% success rate in our clients being shortlisted because once the application is in, then we can work very closely with that estate agent and, and use our relationship, if you like, yep. with them yep. to get that application shortlisted. All right. Good. 
good to understand. Um, someone's asked a question mm. here. Hi, Robin. Do you assist with having rentals set up with utilities as well as temporary mm. furniture um, on arrival? Absolutely. Um, utility connections, I actually insist on doing it myself, yeah. well, not me personally, but we do it ourselves because we would need to make sure that it's done properly. And very often our clients are still overseas and they need to be flying in straight into their yep. property. So um, we've got an international starter pack that we can do for some clients, which is literally just mattresses, pantry shop, duvets or dunas, whichever one you want to call it, yeah. um, linen towels, things so that they can have their first night in their house without expensing a hotel. Yep. We can also arrange rental furniture or we work with them to buy everything online and have it delivered the day that they arrive. So they might go into a hotel for a night or two okay. just while they get everything yep. um, delivered. When I lived in the UK, it was really common to find rental houses fully furnished with everything you could yes. ever think of barring a, a tv maybe but australia doesn't do it like that really do they no no i would say probably 20 percent of our market is furnished yep, okay. and generally i find it's grandma's hand-me-downs yep. it's not you know unless it's a nice apartment in the city or something yep. like that we do work with another company who can send in interior designers and actually put all the furniture in you know you can buy a package from them yep. Um, and they can do it all. But a lot of our relocations know that they, that might just be their starting house and they don't necessarily want to be moving furniture all, all, all around. So they might rent furniture until their container arrives or just use the, the starter pack until they can get settled. Yeah, okay. Good stuff. All right, moving right along. DIY research. How do I do it? How do I do it myself? Because obviously you're a, you're a wealth of knowledge, um, but people also need to sort of, you know, stand on their own two feet and do their own research. And, you know, the more research people do, yeah. the better. So how do people do research? How do people do effective research? I think, I think what people need to realize is that yes, they can do research if they know what to ask and they know how to ask it. Asking on Facebook, what's a good suburb for two kids with good schools? And Sam, you know what it's like. Everybody loves where they live. Yeah, true. So a, a question like that will get 100 replies and they will be all over. Yeah. And people don't really relate to how big Australia is, how Sydney is or Melbourne. Yeah. So it's, if, you know, if you had to pinpoint all of those, it would be ridiculous. So really, if you're asking questions on social media, they need to be quite specific as to perhaps I've identified Sandringham Primary School. Has anybody got some experience there? Then you're going to get more relevant answers. Yep. Asking on social media, you're asking people who have maybe moved once in their life. Yep. And whilst their replies are really well intentioned, yep. they don't know your family, they don't know your budget. Um, there's a lot of things that need, there's a lot of working parts in a relocation. Um, I, I, you know, not trying to plug the book, but honestly, for $25, that's the best resource you could possibly find yep. with the right information and the right expert advice. Um, schools are a good thing to ask on social media, furniture, those sorts of things, but not asking huge questions about, you know, which school, which suburb. You've got to keep it smaller, yep. you know, make sure that your questions are more directed to a not a smaller audience, but a um, yeah. smaller needs, if you... Yeah, you know. you've, you've got to tailor that question, don't you, so that you don't get the 100 answers of everyone saying, yeah, my school's the best. You've got to actually say something more direct yeah. and a question which is, you know, tailored and funneled down to something which is going to get you an answer, which is of some use to you. I can see that how that's um, how that would work best. Yes. Yes, it's just going to... The thing you don't want to do when you're researching your own move is get confused. Uh, because you 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 gonna ask on a social media platform ask a question you might get 10 replies and think oh that's good and then you start researching and you look at that and then you go into the next one and you look at that one and you actually walk away just feeling more confused yeah. so rather go direct and get the right information sometimes too much yeah too much broad content is not good it's like when you're on netflix and you're trying to yeah. choose something to watch and you just keep on flicking and flicking and flicking and if someone just told you go and watch this because it's really good i watched it yesterday oh thank god someone's yes. someone's directed me yes. to where i need to go 
Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I've had it even this week where, you know, you've done the shortlisting of suburbs with a client um, and you've had a look at everything, what the kids are doing, the sports, the what the wife's doing, what the husband's doing. You've had a look at all that, said, OK, this is probably the right fit for you. That fits in with your budget, your commute times. We've done all that. Mm. And then they go and start work and somebody says, oh, but Turak is really nice. And then they come back to me and say, oh, what did you think about Turak? And I'm like, well, um, no, because, you know, that, uh, no. it's not going to work with your budget. Yeah. <laughs> Turek is, you know, I wouldn't start looking under Turek at, you know, 1500 a week kind of thing. Yeah. So, no, that's not going to work for you. It's a lovely suburb, but yeah. it's not you. It's million dollar um, houses. So, yeah. well, it's, it's, it's multi-million dollar houses for people who don't understand Turek. Um, that's that's a Melbourne <laughs> joke. Um, yes. All right. So, do the research. You personally run a Facebook group. Is that right? Yeah, I run a few Facebook groups. So we've got um, the personal relocations page, but we've also started a new one, which is the Plan for Australia Information Hub. I'll grab you a link for that shortly. Um, but in the Plan for Australia, it's I do frequently asked questions. So I do a video every week on a frequently asked question, mm. and I take questions that people are actually asking me, and I'll do a video response to those questions. So that's really helpful. Right. Um, and I'm starting Friday Feelings because I'm really trying to get people to address more of the mental health issues and their mental preparedness yeah. for their move. Yeah. Um, I know that the move is busy. I know you're against all these forces and you're still trying to manage daily life in, in the home country, but taking care of your mental health is going to make it easier on the whole family and the whole move. And being, so Friday feels I'll be doing in there as well. And being prepared mentally for, for certain things, like mm. not being with your family or, you know, how do you get contact in, back in contact with your your family or your friends or how do you stay engaged with people back home while still trying to you know yep. start a new life in your in your home country um and, yes. and and dealing with those feelings of oh i've spent all this time money and energy and effort to migrate to a new country and now i'm homesick what am i like this is tearing me apart yes i think it's good for people look i've had migrants who i've spent years with obtaining a visa for and they and this was, I mean, this was some time ago now, but I've had migrants come to Australia, migrate to Australia, spend like 18 months here and then go back home to South Africa or back home to the UK yeah. and just say, oh, yeah. this this wasn't for me. And, and that breaks my heart. And I think a lot mm. of that comes down to they mm. weren't prepared mentally for what it was going to take. They, that they, they weren't prepared yes. mentally for the fact that they're not going to live in the same suburb or a similar suburb to what they did back home. And they're not going to have, you know, friends next door like they did back home and and it's there's a there's a honeymoon period to getting used to this new country which doesn't happen immediately i can see you just put a link in the chat yes. box for your um facebook group so people go ahead and yes. take that link and put it in your favorites and join the group and talk to robin in her facebook yeah. group yeah, definitely. It's very interactive and it's there as a private and, and comfortable space to be able to ask questions and interact with us. But I also hope that people find other friends on the same journey as them. And there's people on there from all around the world. That's good. Um, but just, yeah. you know, saying what you were saying now about that prep preparation before you leave and, you know, preparing grandparents, how is that relationship going to look in years to come? All those things are so important. And 87% of um relocations fail because of family issues yeah. Yeah. so you need to address those family issues you know dual incomes things like that those all make a big impact on on the success of your relocation for sure for sure well look that pretty much brings us to the end of our formal presentation if anyone has any questions that we would be or robin would be happy to field them obviously i won't because robin's person i send questions to um so if anyone feels the need then please put a question um in the chat box um I, i've got a question robin you're you're a relocation mm -hmm. specialist but you you work with a number of different agents around australia is that right do you mean as immigration agents no, no, no. or my consultants? As your consultants. Yeah. So obviously you're based here in yeah. Melbourne, which is where I live. Yes. Uh, and it's a big country. So yes. for you to get to Adelaide every second day to <laughs> check on a rental, you're not doing it yourself, right? So you've got your own no. um, relocation agents spread across Australia who are doing all different areas of Australia. Is that right? That's right. So what we do is I'm as the 
face of the business and one of the few relocation companies that's out there saying I'm personally involved in your relocation so I start with every relocation and I'll do the first Zoom consultation with the family just to make sure that they understand everything. Um, we shortlist the suburbs, we start preparing the rental application. So all that is done with, with myself. Um, and then I have consultants around the country who do the actual um, housing shortlist and the inspections. Yeah. Once we've inspected a property, we'll send the client videos and photographs of the house and obviously come up with a plan of how we think we should apply for this house because you, your rental application is like a, a job interview yeah, almost. Yeah. You know, you've got the covering letter, you've got all the um, backstory behind it. So making sure that we've got the right story prepared for that particular property, um, helping the client file that application, handling any negotiations that they might be chasing them chasing the estate agents for the applications um, and you know just making sure that people understand that they can apply for more than one house at a time um, and and we then set up their preferences so the local consultants around the country will do the actual home inspections yep. um, once the house has been secured we help them send money because <laughs> they need to send money yep. <laughs> to pay for the rent and the and the first week's bond or so the bond and the first week's rent yep. Um, and that obviously comes back through yourselves as well. So yep. that is done, the utilities are connected and then any other services that they might be doing. So if we're managing a full relocation, then we let the removals company know the new address. Um, the company might need to know the address, whoever needs to. And then once they land, it's okay, this is what you do first. Then you do that, do your tax file number you know, and, and lead them through all the settling in services. Yeah. And so typically you're in touch with a client of yours, a new migrant to Australia after they've arrived for the first month, six months, six years. How long would you be in touch with someone for? It depends on which service they've chosen. So some people only engage us to do what we call the inspect for you, which is for inspections. Right. Um, and I developed that program because most of our relocations, we were actually settling and securing a home within four inspections. Right. So there was, I didn't see the need in charging people for an unlimited service when they didn't need yep. all that. Yep. Um, so some people might just engage us for that. And some people, we have a lot of returning Australians, for example, who don't need us to hold their hand to open a tax file number, a bank account, or Medicare. So they might not choose that. So then we would probably only be in touch with them, you know, for a week or two weeks after they land. But other people that have chosen the settling in services would be checking in with them. Um, we even send a birthday card for their first Australian birthday, just so they know somebody's thinking of them. That's nice. um, but yes, there's there's a few few touch points depending on the package that they've chosen. Oh, that's nice. Um, we've got a question in the chat box. Um, how does a consultation okay. work? Is it an hourly mm -hmm. booking for a standard introductory session, or is it a more loose arrangement depending on what we want to ask and discuss. So do you have an, do you do it on an hourly rate, Robin, or do you do the initial consultation on a particular fee? How do you, how do you structure that? Yeah, it is a, it's a fee based um, consultation because it is quite involved. There's quite a lot of information that we share in that. Um, we'll send out a, a shortened needs analysis. So when we're doing a full relocation, the first step is a needs analysis. And for a full relocation for a family, that's probably about eight or nine pages as we get to know the family. Um, but for a consultation, it's a slightly shorter one. And the person who's obviously purchased the consultation can choose what they want to talk about. Um, most people want to talk about the rental application process or shortlisting suburbs or schools. So there's usually, they give me an indication of what they want to talk about, but that little smaller needs analysis will also give me some indications of what I think they might have missed. You know, what, what is in their timeline that I think they should be taking into account. Yeah. For example, somebody contacted me the other day and we were having a casual conversation until they said to me they had already shipped their furniture. And I was what you've done hang on oh, <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> yeah it's like when yeah. clients say to me they, oh, I've, already, I've already booked my flights i'm like you haven't even got a visa yet and you book flights no hang on yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
exactly. You know, they just thought, no, but we wanted the container to get there by the time we arrived. And I'm like, no, 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 because you're going to get taxed yeah. because it's not your personal things that you're bringing in. That's you know, right. you, you can't do that. Or, you know, the person who's just putting a motorbike in the back of their container. I'm like, no, no, you can't just do that. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, so, you know, just talking to people, there's often t things that I can sort of say, oh, no, red flag, yep. hold on. Whoa, yep. what have you done there? Yeah, great. Great. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that was good. So at the end of the day, I think um, best way to answer all the other questions, which everyone has, is to get in touch. So here's the contact us uh, information. Um, uh, Robin's details are on the right hand side of page there. So you've got a, an email address and Robin's uh, website also. And then obviously uh, Sail International, where we're here to assist you with um, other facets of your move. Contact uh, my colleagues in our Cape Town office to talk immigration law um, and contact our office in South Africa uh, to talk about all other things, foreign exchange, uh, money transfers, tax, um, wealth, accounting, the list goes on. Check the website for all the other uh, services that we provide. Um, someone's asked another question, so we'll just do this last question and then we'll finish up. Um, mm -hmm. Based on your own budget and the approach of trying to get a work visa for a specific job, is there a single easiest way, this, this sounds like a different question, is there a single easiest way to see if we're wasting our time in trying to obtain a visa, i.e. is there a fairly straightforward way of checking qualifying occupations? Okay, that's an immigration-based question, I can answer that. Um, to the person who, who asked that question, actually there is a pretty single easy way to determine and that's get in touch with us, talk to, talk to Tana in my Cape Town office. If you're in South Africa, give her a call. She'll have a chat with you. Uh, she will put you in the right direction. We will perform an assessment for you to determine if you're eligible um, or what your chances might be. Um, cool. We're gonna, I, yep. wonder if, I wonder if that person was asking a consultation for yourself rather than me and we just assumed it was me and I spoke. <laughs> Yeah, good, good point. Could good be. point, Robin. Look, um, <laughs> we both do consultations and get in touch. Here's our contact details and we're, we're happy to do consultations. We both do very different things. Oh, no, both both questions, great answers. Thank you. So thank you to the person who, answered, who asked that. Um, get in touch. As I say, Rob and I do very different things, um, but for the same market, for the same clientele, um, you may work with both of us. Um, yeah, I know if you're going to work with Robin, you'll get a great service. I send clients to her all the time and clients rave about her and her service and, and how much time it saved them and how much heartache it saved them. I honestly, um, I should have shares in your business or in your book, Robin, because I, 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 I love your book and everyone should go and buy it. So there, I'm going to finish on that. Robin, it was really fun. Thank it was you. great to chat with you as always. We normally do it in the flesh over coffee, but this was just as fun and hopefully it was informative uh, to our audience. For everyone who was online live to watch it, thank you. Uh, you will receive an email to um, watch it back anytime you want. Um, and for those who didn't catch it live, well, you're not listening to this live, but you will get an email also to um, provide you a link to watch it back live, to watch it back on uh, on record. Robin, um, thank you. We'll do it again soon. Thank you so much, Sam. I appreciate the opportunity, and thanks to everybody who joined us. I appreciate it. I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Terry. Bye now. Bye. -bye.